Hello Viking TV. My name is Damon Stanwell Smith. I'm Viking's Head of Science and Sustainability. And I've been with Viking since July 2019. I'm presenting today as I've had the privilege of traveling and working in the Antarctic and in South Georgia since 1992. After this presentation, I'll be joined by colleagues and answering questions live. So please feel free to submit them throughout the presentation. I'm happy to be here today to tell you more about one of our expedition itineraries. Viking has created the ultimate itineraries for those of you who've dreamed of discovering truly remote wilderness. Today, we will focus on one of our signature expedition voyages that allows you to sail from the tip of South America to the last continent of Antarctica, home to towering mountains, glacial plateaus and colonies of penguins. Magnificent wildlife and dramatic unexplored landscapes will unfold before you during landings and excursions and as you relax in the comfort of your state-of-the-art stateroom. Set sail from Ushuaia to the Falkland Islands, renowned for their spectacular landscapes with rugged coves and white sand beaches. Call it South Georgia, one of the least visited places on earth and witness extraordinary wildlife. Then voyage across the Southern Ocean to the Antarctic Peninsula with its towering glaciers and magnificent icebergs of the last continent. At the far ends of the earth, in some of the most extreme environments imaginable, live some of the world's most resilient creatures. Antarctica's nearly unlivable conditions for most of the year are well documented. Yet life abounds during the short but spectacular summer season on the White Continent. The oceans are filled with fascinating life, including some of the world's largest living mammals. With their distinctive humps and unique black and white tail patterns, humpback whales are easy to spot in these frigid waters. Humpbacks come to Antarctica's polar waters each summer to feed on massive shoals of tiny krill, a nearly microscopic relative of the shrimp, before migrating to warmer waters where they give birth to their young. Other marine mammals like the distinctive leopard seal, named for its black spotted coat, also call these waters home. These big pinnipeds can weigh over 800 pounds. They're hunters living on smaller seals, penguins, birds, fish and squid. The only predator they fear is the mighty killer whale. On shore, you won't see large, iconic animals like those of the Arctic. In fact, the largest terrestrial inhabitant here is but half an inch long the wingless midge, an insect. However, what you will find in adorable abundance are penguins. Of the 17 species of penguin in the world, seven spend time in Antarctica. Of these, two species are found nowhere else. The bountiful Adelie penguin with an estimated population of 2.5 million pairs and a rarer sighting on your expedition, the regal emperor penguin, who also calls Antarctica home year round. These majestic creatures can grow to four and a half feet tall. Penguins have evolved over time to swim rather than fly. With their wings acting as flippers, they glide gracefully through the Antarctic seas. Research has shown their waddling to be a highly effective means of walking on snow and ice. And when they toboggan across slick snow on their stomachs, they can outpace a running human. Let's look at the itinerary map for more on this journey. This itinerary is available in one direction, beginning with a hotel stay in Buenos Aires. After a charter flight to Ushuaia, you will then board your ship and sail to the Isle of South Georgia and then Antarctica before returning to Ushuaia. In 19 days, you will visit two continents and three countries. If you'd like to arrive early, get orientated and 
experience more of South America prior to your sailing. We have four pre-extension packages. On our Buenos Aires and the Parana Delta extension, uncover two sides to Argentina during your three night stay in Buenos Aires and Tigre. Discover Argentina's vibrant culture at a historic cafe and enjoy a thrilling evening of tango performance. Travel deep into the heart of the Parana Delta and explore its enchanting waterways, islands and wetlands. In Buenos Aires, take a scenic drive through the city en route to the famed Café Tortoni. This historic coffee house has served as an artistic and intellectual epicenter since 1858, hosting guests such as renowned author Jorge Luis Borges. In the evening, enjoy the alluring melodies of tango during a memorable performance and dinner at the Rojo Tango Cabaret. Then leave the bustle of Buenos Aires behind for the tranquility of Tigre, gateway to the Parana Delta. Board a boat for a scenic cruise through a captivating green labyrinth of channels. The remainder of this day is yours to enjoy the many available activities, such as kayaking around the islands and trekking along forest paths. We also have another pre-extension in Buenos Aires that also includes the Iguazu Falls. Explore the Atlantic forest and witness the majestic Iguazu Falls up close. With an expert guide, immerse yourself in nature as you discover the myths and legends of the falls. Admire vibrant and cosmopolitan Buenos Aires, home of the tango, and enjoy an enchanting performance. Board a train and then follow the walkways to see the impressive Devil's Throat, where the Iguazu River crashes down to form a collection of rainbows. Explore the upper and lower trails and walkways for spectacular views of the falls, or see the sights from the lower canyon on board a Zodiac and take a ride through the jungle trails by truck. During this extension, you will also travel to the small private reserve of La Lorenza Iguazu, where you will board a kayak and paddle on the Parania River. Your guide will offer insight into the local flora and fauna as you gently glide on South America's second longest river. Another extension offers a chance to visit the Atacama Desert in Chile, one of the most intriguing landscapes on the planet. Venture into the driest place on Earth to admire the salt plains and bizarre rock formations set against a backdrop of giant volcanoes. Then gaze at the stars and planets that shine in the crystal clear desert skies. Embark on a panoramic drive to the Atacama Salt Flats, where one of your several stops will include the Los Flamencos National Reserve in Laguna Chaxa. The bright blue pools here attract a colony of flamingos, while the Rocky Mountain Rim landscape is awe-inspiring. You will also visit the Valley of the Moon, where the elements have eroded the rocks into bizarre formations. In the evening, join your knowledgeable astronomy guides and learn about the constellations and other cosmic wonders benefiting from this crystal clear skies. On this pre-extension package, immerse yourself in local traditions and folklore of the Rapa Nui people of Easter Island. Learn about the significance of the monolithic moais, enigmatic stone sculptures that dot this Polynesian island. Discover the rich heritage of the islanders, whose ancestors have resided here for generations. View the ceremonial site of Tahai with its altars and monolithic statues and the seven well-preserved ocean-facing moais of the Ahu Akibi. You will also see the moais at Vehu and statues at Akahanga. Continue to the Rano Rahraku volcano, the site of the quarry where all moais were sculpted. Around 400 of them were left in various stages of completion. View the restored platform at Hanga Nui Bay, then meet the children benefiting from the efforts to preserve the Rapa Nui culture at the Toki project. Now, a few words about weather, when to travel and what to pack. This itinerary is offered in late October and in January, which is during the Antarctic summer. Antarctica is the windiest continent on Earth, so we recommend that you dress in layers. And given the nature of our expedition voyages, you want to pack quick drying or waterproof clothing and accessories. If you're interested in wildlife, the Antarctic summer is when animals are most active. 
The bird life and marine mammals are all breeding and feeding on the abundant planktonic life that thrives in the long days of austral summer daylight. A few words about our expedition ships. We have applied more than two decades of experience and expertise in river and ocean voyages to create the perfect expedition experience that will live up to our commitment to keep you exploring the world in comfort. Here is a quote from the famous Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen that speaks to the intention and thought behind the design of our state-of-the-art polar class expedition ships, Viking Octantis and Viking Polaris. He said, I may say that this is the greatest factor, the way in which the expedition is equipped, the way in which every difficulty is foreseen and precautions taken for meeting or avoiding it. Victory awaits him who has everything in order. For expedition voyages, Viking is proud to introduce two new purpose-built ships, optimally sized for expeditions, small enough to navigate remote areas, yet large enough to provide speed, superior handling and stability in the roughest seas. Throughout the ships, there is a focus on panoramic views. You'll be as close as possible to the most majestic scenery on Earth. Our vessels merge comfort and exploration in an unprecedented way. This optimised size also facilitates enhanced enrichment activities by carrying a fleet of Zodiacs, special operations boats, two-seater kayaks and six-seater submarines and providing outstanding venues for onboard lectures and learning. A few words about our new expedition features. The hangar, a Viking exclusive, this unique in-ship marina is sheltered from the wind and waves. Our special operations boat has an easy launch access. Nine shell doors located around the ship enable launching from the most protected section of the vessel. The science lab is our comprehensively equipped onboard research facility and our citizen science programs further enable discovery and immersion into your destinations. If you've traveled with Viking before, you know that we have the most knowledgeable tour guides. Here, you'll travel with Viking's professional expedition team, including resident scientists. Science is an important aspect of your experiences during your voyage with experiential activities and fieldwork. One example, take a Zodiac to land in Antarctica and encounter penguins. On our expedition itineraries, virtually all activities are included in your cruise fare to ensure you maximise your discoveries. Activities include everything from special operation boat sailings and zodiac landings to tranquil kayak outings and underwater submarine dives. Hike through magnificent landscapes and access remote areas, all led by our experienced team of experts skilled in operating in rugged and polar environments. Or we'll try a unique experience with one of our exclusive limited capacity optional excursions. Viking has partnered with leading globally recognised institutions to enrich your experience. Acroplan Niva is part of the Norwegian Institute for Water Research, or NIVA, and are engaged in cross-disciplinary research programmes on water-related issues. On our ships, NIVA automated oceanographic instruments, called ferry boxes, are installed to sample sea and lake water to provide continuous information about oxygen levels, temperature, salinity and other data. IATO and ACO. Viking holds a provisional membership with the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators, or IATO, and the Association of Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators, or ACO. We work closely with these organisations to ensure we employ best travel practices, promote awareness, support scientific research, and protect the fragile ecosystems and environments in which we travel. Noah Glow. The US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission is forecasting weather, monitoring oceanic and atmospheric conditions, charting the seas, conducting deep sea exploration and managing fishing and protection of marine mammals and endangered species. We support NOAA's mission through collaborative scientific monitoring, which includes our ships being designated NOAA National Weather Service weather stations, from which we launch regular weather balloons. We have also partnered with the globally recognised Cornell Lab of Ornithology, whose ornithologists are regularly on board, 
field testing new observation methods and providing guests advice and interaction. The Polar Citizen Science Collective creates opportunities for research and public education through citizen science, leveraging the reach of polar travellers to enhance understanding and protection of the polar regions. And Viking is a proud partner of the University of Cambridge's Scott Polar Research Institute, whose scientists undertake fieldwork on board our expedition ships and share their expertise with our guests. Now let's explore Antarctica and the island of South Georgia day by day. Welcome to Buenos Aires, where your voyage begins. Some of you will join us after your pre-extension stay. Others will arrive in South America today. If you've arranged air travel through Viking, we will transfer you from the airport to your hotel. Time permitting, you may wish to explore Argentina's cosmopolitan capital. On day two, you'll travel by charter plane to the very tip of South America, to Ushuaia, the world's southernmost city. Board your Viking expedition ship and take time to get to know your ship, your expedition team and crew. On day three, trace the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, an underwater mountain range longer than the Rockies, the Himalayas and the Andes combined. Its hidden towering peaks divide the Atlantic Ocean in half, north to south. Enjoy the amenities of your ship as you sail. Perhaps take a breath of fresh air on a brisk walk around the promenade deck or begin your day with a workout in the well-equipped fitness centre. On day four, you will call on West Point Island in the Falkland Islands, which boasts some of the most magnificent coastal vistas with soaring cliffs spilling into the surf. The island and its neighbours also enjoy status as an important bird and biodiversity area as designated by BirdLife International. Significant species include the Falkland steamer duck, black-browed albatross, southern rockhopper penguins and Magellanic penguins. Beach your zodiac on the remote shores of West Point Island, then embark on a scientist-led hike to discover the various habitats and local wildlife which call these rugged landscapes home. You may also set out into the South Atlantic Ocean by kayak to experience your surroundings up close. Navigate your kayak past rugged landscapes and keep watch for local wildlife. Your next destination will be Port Stanley. Visitors to the main island of East Falkland, from curious travellers to expedition ship crews en route to Antarctica, experience British warmth in Port Stanley's pubs and at the charming Victorian stone cathedral. Remarkably, there are about 200 sheep for every person in this starkly beautiful archipelago. Yet the Falklands are also known for their biological diversity. Five penguin species call the islands home, from the king penguins to the gentoos and the Magellanics on farther shores. If you're interested in the history and traditions of the Falklands and seeing Port Stanley's landmarks, I recommend our highlights of the Port Stanley excursion. Drive along Ross Road, Port Stanley's main thoroughfare, and take in the city's main highlights, including the cathedral with its whalebone arch, the 1982 Battle Memorial, the wrecks of old sailing ships, and some of the original houses dating back to the mid-19th century. Or if you prefer to see the wildlife of the Falklands, discover the thriving penguin population and abundant bird species of Bluff Cove Lagoon, a private wildlife haven. Set against the backdrop of a large lagoon and white sand beaches, this pristine nature reserve is home to more than a thousand breeding pairs of Gen 2 penguins and a growing colony of king penguins. Observe penguin life and keep watch for many other birds that frequent the beach, including terns, geese and skewers. As you then voyage across the South Atlantic Ocean and Scotia Sea, follow in the wake of the great explorers. Captain James Cook, who traversed these waters, claimed the island of South Georgia for Britain in 1775. As you sail today, savour a range of international cuisine on board. Choose from a variety of international flavours at the World Cafe, enjoy al fresco dining on the Aquavit Terrace, or regional specialities in the restaurant. Arrive at South Georgia and admire its untamed beauty. With its rugged landscapes, mountainous hillsides and spectacular glaciers. It was discovered and mapped by Captain James Cook in 1775 and has featured on many explorers charts since then. Sir Anna Shackleton first traversed his waters in 1916 when he famously sailed 800 miles in a small open boat from the South Shetlands to South Georgia. He returned in 1921 in an attempt to map the coastline of the Antarctic 
and is buried at the church in Gritvik. To this day, South Georgia remains one of the least visited places on Earth. It is home to an abundance of wildlife, including a myriad of king penguins, breeding elephant seals and fur seals, and colonies of the iconic wandering albatross. As with all Viking ships, your expedition vessel doubles as a classroom in which you can learn more about your destination. Gather with your Viking expedition team to discuss the day's activities before heading out. As you sail the legendary waters of the South Atlantic Ocean and south into the Southern Ocean, attend an informative lecture or watch a film on our 8K laser projected panoramic screen in the Aula, one of the world's most advanced venues for learning at sea. This indoor outdoor experience allows nature to take center stage with its retractable screen and floor to ceiling windows that unveil 270 degree views. And welcome to Antarctica, where you'll have five days to soak up the majestic beauty of this isolated corner of the globe. Keep an eye out for whales and their natural habitat, as well as seals, penguins and petrels. Landscapes include colourful lichens and rocky beaches. Also be sure to take in the basalt cliffs, columns of volcanic rock that form unique geometric patterns. During your expedition activities, we offer complimentary use of our speciality outerwear and expedition equipment so that you can fully experience your destination in comfort. One of your shore excursions today might include kayaking amongst glaciers or hiking a snow covered beach. These intimate vessels allow you to experience your surroundings up close. Note the distinct crackling sound glacial ice makes as air bubbles trapped inside are released. On day 17, you'll start your sail north through the Drake Passage. This legendary route was named after its discoverer, Sir Francis Drake. The frigid waters of the Drake Passage stretch for some 600 miles between Livingston Island on the South Shetland archipelago and Cape Horn. Here you may glimpse humpback whales and see wheeling albatross soaring behind the ship. After many days of exploring, this is the perfect time to relax with a treatment at the Nordic Spa. Whether you unwind in the sauna, refresh in the snow grotto or take a dip in the thermal pool, you will feel recharged and revitalised. Next, we sail the Beagle Channel in Cape Horn, where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet. The Cape was originally named Carp Horn by the 17th century Dutch merchant and explorer Willem Schouten, after the city of Horn in the Netherlands. To this day, rounding the Cape is a milestone reserved for experienced sailors. On your Viking expedition ship, you will join the ranks of other intrepid seafarers who have completed this legendary passage between the two oceans. Heading back to South America, your journey with Viking concludes back in Ushuaia. After breakfast on board, many of you will disembark and proceed to the airport for your charter flight. Bid farewell to your fellow travellers and journey home. For those interested in continuing your travels, we have a great post extension package in the Patagonia region. Explore both the Chilean and Argentine sides of Patagonia, a region of singular beauty. Admire the rugged peaks of Torre del Paine National Park, the blue waters of Lake Argentino, the sweeping views from atop Calafate Balcony, and one of the world's only advancing glaciers, the vast Parito Moreno. Experience a full day excursion to Los Glaciares National Park and the Parito Moreno Glacier. Drive through the Andean Patagonian Forest to the Curve of Size, or Curva de los Suspiros, where you will get your first glimpse of the vast glacier. Walk down a series of catwalks, listening to the hiss and crack of immense chunks of ice as they carve off the glacier and tumble into Lake Argentino. You will also take an unforgettable scenic drive through the snow-capped mountains across the Argentine border into Chile. Explore Talda Paine National Park, a wonderland of soaring mountains, blue glaciers and shimmering lakes and rivers. Admire the park's iconic mountain ranges, the Paine Towers, Talda Paine, and the Paine Horns, Cuernos del Paine. Visit waterfalls in the Grey Lake area, where you'll see glacial blocks of ice floating in the water. The park is also known for its vivid vegetation and wildlife. 
Well, thank you for joining me today on Viking TV. This concludes our presentation. We will now answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Damon. Uh, my name is Bree, and I am here in our Viking California office to ask questions on behalf of the guests at home to all of the colleagues joining you. Uh, questions have been submitted via Facebook and Viking.tv. So getting into this itinerary, we have some questions about the expedition product at large. And our first comes from Chester in Alabama, who asks, are there included excursions on this itinerary, just like on oceans and rivers? And I will throw it to you, Damon, Aaron, Yorn, and Jean to answer that one. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can take that. Um, yeah, there are including included excursions, and uh, and most of them are uh, indeed included. Uh, we come to places uh, much of the time, especially on our Antarctic and South Georgia itineraries, with no infrastructure ashore, uh, and meaning that uh, whatever we do, we we do it ourselves uh, with our own means, equipment, and people. Uh, and uh, those are uh, by and large included uh, in the fare uh, of, uh, of the voyage, with only very few exceptions. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, as a guest, I can say you're going to have more excursions than you can handle. They're very full days because the team, and I was not on South Georgia, but on Antarctic Explorer, the team worked tirelessly to get you out as much as possible on every option. So as far as included, it was more than I could fit into my day often. Wonderful, thank you. I actually have a related question from Allison in Minnesota. She asks, a number of days for this cruise are slated for sailing days. What do these days typically consist of? What is a normal sea day look, uh, what does a normal sea day look like on an expedition cruise? Aaron, would you like to? Okay, I will jump. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, talk about that. Uh, sea days are a wonderful time to learn about the area we're traveling. Uh, so uh, the first person you heard from, uh, I guess, after Damon's presentation was uh, Joran Henriksen, is our director of expeditions. Uh, you've heard from uh, Jean Glock, of course. I think you all know Jean, our ambassador at large. And, uh, and I was fortunate to sail with her in uh, October. I guess it was on the Polaris. Um, and uh, I'm... Uh, uh, part of that expedition operations team as well, head of expedition operations. Uh, so I've sailed to South Georgia many a time. I've spent many a sea day on on uh, our ships and on many ships crossing. And, and sea days are wonderful. Um, there's a few things you need to do on sea days. One, you, re you rest and recuperate. You recover from the travel to get to the ship, but you also recover from the previous day's activities. Uh, so you need downtime to do that, to write in your journal, uh, to... Um, well, it used to be to change over your rolls of film, but uh, but now it's to have a look through some of the film, the photos you've taken. Um, that's a time to uh, to enjoy the amenities on board the ship. We have fantastic dining experiences on the ship, the spa, the gym, uh, and then it's a time to learn about the area. And our our expedition team on board the ship has uh, our team of specialists, lecturers who will talk about the various uh, the history, the the geology of the region, the ice, the the wildlife that we're going to experience. They'll tell you the, the reality and they'll tell you their anecdotes, their stories about their experiences in those, those regions. And that could be through a formal setting in our aula, our, our big auditorium on the stern, but it can also be through informal settings. Uh, that's at Expedition Central, our, our sort of meeting point where you get to meet up with the expedition team anytime throughout the day. You can come by and ask questions of them. It could be through workshops in the studio, uh, just across the starboard side of the ship, across from Expedition Central, or up in the living room. Uh, it could be just sitting down, grabbing someone, one of our specialists, and uh, we're, we're fairly identifiable on the ship. Uh, many of us are wearing the Dulla sweaters uh, that you see uh, three of the four of us here wearing. Um, and so grab one of the one of the uh, specialists and and sit them down somewhere and ask them questions. Um, uh, 
uh, but it's it's a mix of formal and informal interaction and enrichment that uh, that happens during the sea days. And part of that is is you know talking perhaps about what you've just experienced in the previous day's activities as we move to a new region. Say we've left the Falkland Islands behind and we're heading to South Georgia. We'll recap the Falklands with some education, um, and then we'll start to to prepare you for South Georgia. As we leave South Georgia, we recap South Georgia and we start to prepare you for the Antarctic. Each region is different and special, and we want you to appreciate each region and and uh, and maximize what you take from that region. So that's what Sea Days are all about for me. <laughs> there are also some important things you do. You do your kayak test if you choose to kayak, so you can go down and see the intricacies of getting in and out and learn and you get your boots fitted that they provide. So it, it's really the anticipation is building as well and in, in among all the lectures and talks and fun happening on board. Fantastic. I think I think I think uh, going going to uh, Antarctica and having those couple of days uh, at sea uh, or say in between South Georgia and uh, the Antarctic Peninsula between Falklands and South Georgia you know, it's it's you know, it's a bit of a rite of passage. Your mind travels the same speed as as your body. Uh, there are no flights available down there, so you can't uh, you can't uh, get there faster than you can prepare for for it. So we spend all uh, that valuable time on board to uh, to make sure that everybody is prepared, because there are a few things that we need to remember and. And we like to consider the guests, all the guests on board, an extension of the expedition team. They're part of the expedition team. Uh, and uh, everybody needs to be on the same page once we hit that shore. And there are thousands of penguins, vulnerable wildlife, plants, uh, geology, and so on. Everybody needs to be at a certain level uh, in terms of knowledge how to... Uh, how to protect and take care of these fantastic places that we're going to. So we, we spend that time well. Could I just add also a little scientific flavor? So as well as my colleagues highlighting the, the rite of passage and the, the way that uh, ocean days work is that there's a lot of oceanographic science that can be done. Sea days are wonderful times for spending a bit of time in the laboratory that we have on board, um, bird watching, uh, Southern Ocean, South Atlantic, fantastic for seabird watching and indeed marine mammal observations, whether that be from your stateroom or indeed from the big public areas. Um, and, and as you had mentioned, that that's uh, there is a rite of passage. The seas can move around a little, and that you you get to you get to enjoy the wildlife, this remarkable um, remote place. So um, uh, I personally love sea days. I think many travelers do um, because it's not the, it's not so much it's the gaps between things although there is an intense activity as Jean said that you want to recover from and get ready for but um, the travel of itself and then one final thought is that um, a, a sort of secretly I often feel when I'm on on one of our vessels is they have wonderful libraries beautiful curated libraries and honestly if if, if we could all just take a few months and sit quietly and read our way through. These are curated libraries that are phenomenal for understanding expedition travel in the past, uh, destination uh, information, and, um, and all about the sort of the science and related uh, natural history of the places that we're going to. So uh, I think between the four of us, there's a, there's a, you get the sense that we all like our sea days. Yes, thank you very much for all that info. Uh, maybe a great question for you, Damon, to follow up on from Sydney in Palo Alto. He asks, if I choose to book this itinerary, will, th will there be scientists and researchers on board with me? If so, will I have the chance to ask them questions and learn about their research projects? Well, thank you for the question, Sydney. Um, short answer is yes. Um, on every single voyage, we have both uh, Viking employed uh, scientists. Uh, we have a chief scientist on board each of the vessels at any given time who coordinate a team that, that work on different aspects of science. And we have visiting researchers as well from our 
from our partner academic institutions. And on any given voyage, there would be a different individuals doing uh, scientific work with us. And uh, scientists, we, we, we do ensure that the scientists that come with us are good science communicators too. And if you find a good science communicator, you'll find they'd like nothing more than talking about their work and also hopefully sensitise you to the more broad the, the, the work that, uh, that we do. And so uh, any guest showing interest in the science, um, you'll have many and many uh, an enthusiastic conversation about the, the, the research work that's being undertaken on the ships. Can I add one thing I found so unique was Expedition Central, and you had mentioned it, Aaron, but you can always drop in there. And I loved that. You're not you don't have to say, do you have time for coffee to meet me? You can always drop in and there are members of the expedition, the science team. there, always available. And it was that flexibility and that openness that made it one of the most popular spots on the ship. Fantastic. Thank you. Jean, perhaps you can speak more uh, to the onboard experience. We have a question from an Ali from Florida. She asks, uh, well, first she shares, we enjoy the lectures and enrichment on our past cruises and notice there is a theater on the expedition ship. What does onboard entertainment typically consist of on this cruise? It's not what you're probably thinking with entertainment. I call it edutainment, but it is wonderful edutainment. The Aula is the theater that is gorgeously open. You feel like you're out on deck while you're in there. And they will share briefings there. They'll share films, all appropriate to the region. So, But uh, most often it is live briefings and discussions in Aula. And um, there is, of course, on your TV, there's tons of appropriate programming that is there. But um, you're really filling in on the day's activities and preparing for the next day's activities. There's beautiful music on board up in the Explorer um, Lounge. So you can always relax to beautiful music and in the library. So it, it's a different entertainment if you've cruised other ships before, but it's entirely apropos and perfect for the region you're sailing in, just like all the ocean ships do. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Austin in Phoenix asks sort of a related question. Uh, they share, we've cruised before on Vikings ocean ships and are wondering what the onboard experience is like on expedition. Is it different than on a typical Viking ocean voyage? Do you want me to take that? I, I feel like I'm taking more than my share. I can give the quick guest perspective and it is very familiar but honed to expedition and it is marvelously honed. You you will see the World Cafe, but there's an open bakery with 24 hour bakery there. So you can sit and see the landscape and whatever wildlife is there. Um, you will be very familiar. There's Manfredi's, it's a little more intimate. It has an open kitchen. So onboard dining, it's familiar, but perfectly honed to expedition and comfort. Um, gentlemen, I'll let y'all take a little more of that, but I found it very familiar, but enough different that it really fit. Please let me let me uh, let me just emphasize that uh, we put a lot of effort in uh, the expedition ships being a place if you had traveled with either uh, a river ship or in particularly an ocean ship, you would find places that you know and love from from the larger ocean uh, going ships uh, on board the expedition ships. In addition to that, there are a few extra spaces. You mentioned the expedition, expedition central. Uh, the, the Ola is, um, is kind of similar to the theater in the ocean ship, uh, but the content we have in there is uh, slightly different more leaning towards uh, talking about uh, uh, science, uh, talking about uh, wildlife, uh, the wilderness, uh, geology, uh, and you know those aspects of uh, the destination that we're going to, and perhaps less so in terms of kind of show from you know 
80s and uh, musical uh, shows. Uh, but uh, we do have uh, musicians as well. And they are uh, in different lounges at different times. Uh, so, so, so we're not sort of mute to music uh, on board either. Uh, but uh, you know, in the Ola, we focus on, uh, on science uh, and movies or, and films. Uh, particularly films that are relevant to the itinerary you're on as well. Could I just also pick up on something that uh, Jean mentioned in one of previous question about Expedition Central? Um, it is both familiar, as, as Jen said, but also maybe extra, is that on an ocean vessel, when we have five, uh, four or five um, resident uh, lecturers, guest lecturers, that um, when we're in uh, Antarctic waters, we have a team of specialists that number uh, 23. And so with the fewer guests being on an expedition vessel and fourfold, over fourfold the number of the expedition team who are all destination um, enthusiastic and very familiar in different disciplines, the opportunities for that informal interaction, as, as Jean mentioned, about being at Expedition Central and indeed all the other spaces, the public spaces on the vessel, that it, every time I'm sailing on uh, one of our expedition ships, I'm, I notice how often that those informal interactions occur. And it's so often remarked back that it's, that is the, uh, it's, it's in addition to anything you might see on a screen or you see in other spaces. It's just that conversation, that opportunity to reflect and discuss and share your views and, and so on. It's not just sort of information soaking in. Um, and so both familiar, but then sort of more so when we're in these remote places in an expedition context. One important difference, too, is the bow is open. And I never went out on the bow that there weren't two or three mm. naturalists or scientists there, that you just stand there and they discuss what you're seeing. And it, it really adds tremendously to the expedition experience. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, an additional question regarding the wildlife. Uh, Elizabeth in Studio City asks, what, my, what kinds of wildlife might I expect to see around the South Georgia Island that I wouldn't see in Antarctica? Shall I, shall I take that? Yeah, dive in, Aaron. I was going to say, we, I'm sure we could all. <laughs> yeah, we could. Uh, I wanted to jump in on that one. Uh, Elizabeth, that's a great question. And South Georgia is a unique and very special place. Um, <clears throat> What is unique about it is it is isolated. The, the island of South Georgia is, is isolated out in the middle of the South Atlantic, uh, the southern, the top of the Southern Ocean. And, and uh, we have uh, northern elephants, uh, sorry, southern elephant seals at, uh, in, in South Georgia. We've got fur seals on shore in South Georgia. And these are two species that I think are quite iconic to South Georgia. They're not only found in South Georgia, but they're found in numbers that are mind boggling. The, the populations of, of the fur seals and elephant seals have rebounded from, from harvesting, uh, from exploitation over uh, the last few hundred years. Um, and, uh, and, and it is incredible to see, see the, these seals on the beach. Um, and so fur seals and elephant seals, uh, in penguins, we've got uh, king penguins that are uh, are found on the beaches of South Georgia in, uh, in staggering uh, quantity. Um, uh, colonies of, of 100,000 penguins, for example, uh, are not unusual in South Georgia. Uh, so uh, the king penguins are, are magical, and these are a, a penguin that, that are a little taller. They're, they're just over three feet, around three feet in height, and, uh, and they've got that brilliant uh, orange patch on the side of the bill, that, that throat orange or yellowy throat patch and ear patch uh, that makes them just absolutely stunning and a, and a, a, a beautiful uh, um, a silver gray sort of um, cape on their back as they, they sort of mixed into the, the back and the photography of the king penguins even with uh, a phone is uh, is just sensational and a lot of fun to get. So I think uh, from uh, from the sort of the shore side uh, at, at sea, um, where over the last 
well, in my time in South Georgia, which has been over the last 25 years, and I know that's very similar for, to Damon and, and Jorn, uh, when we first started going down there, we didn't see many whales in South Georgia. And, and we are see, seeing more whales um, and, uh, and concentrations and seeing, uh, it's, it's not unusual to see uh, large concentrations of fin whales around South Georgia, especially on the approach. Uh, uh, we've seen blue whales and, and even southern right whales both whales that were heavily harvested almost to, well, they were harvested to commercial extinction, um, not necessarily, obviously not to extinction, but but really the numbers dropped. And, and so, uh, in, and, and those numbers have been recovering since the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, and so we've really noticed that over the, the last 25 years that we've been traveling to South Georgia. So it's it's a destination that's, that is, to some extent, is considered a, a whale watching destination as well. And then I can't leave that uh, topic without covering the, the winged birds or the, the flying birds, because to me, South Georgia, um, the light-mantled sooty albatross to me is the, the bird of South Georgia. Some would say the wandering albatross, which has the greatest wingspan of any seabird. Um, the light-mantled sooty is a, is a smaller version, but the color of the light-mantled sooty, I think, is very compelling, this, this, this sooty, this sort of beige uh, color to it. Uh, but the cry of the light-mantled sooty, the piercing cry through the tussock on the on the bluffs, and I can, I know that Damon and Yorin are both sitting here thinking about a time in South Georgia that they heard that piercing cry of the light-mantled sooty albatross, and you hear that, <laughs> and you know that you're in South Georgia and you're experiencing it. So it is a special, uh, pretty special location. A few other things of note: um, over the last 20 years, the the government of South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands has put a lot of work into habitat restoration. And so a few of the things they've done is they've removed the, uh, the, the herd of reindeer that were brought in by the whalers, uh, Norwegian reindeer brought down to South Georgia and, and survived on the island over about a hundred years. Um, and those reindeer were eradicated from the island in order to allow the tussock grass to, to rebuild, recover um, from the trampling and from the browsing. And, uh, and then the, the government of uh, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands in conjunction with the South Georgia Heritage Trust uh, worked very um, diligently to, to do a, a rat eradication program. So with ships and whaling and fishing and, and that sort of visiting that uh, building of structures in South Georgia, uh, it was a heavily industrialized island for a period. Uh, um, of course, rats came ashore with cargo, and those rats went to town on this island and eradic eradicated a lot, not, not eradicated, but eradicated much of the, uh, I'm a dad, that was a dad joke, um, uh, much of the, the ground dwelling or ground burrowing nesting uh, birds. Um, and so um, there, there was a little endemic bird called the South Georgia pipit, which is, is just about yay big. And I mean, this was, uh, and again, Yorn and Damon are thinking of how hard we worked in 1999 to find the pipit for the birders on our trip. And now they're flittering about because the rats have been eradicated yeah. and the pipit population is rebounding. Um, the, and the, the pintail ducks, and there's a few other, um, I remember the year after, or two years after the successful um, eradication of the rats and getting notes from the South Georgia government that we've got pintail ducklings uh, in Great Vicken or at King Edward yeah. Point. The first time we've seen one in 30 years here. Um, and so that's I, I used to, uh, hey Aaron, I used to remember in the, in the late 90s and the early 2000s when there were still rats uh, and, um, and we couldn't find the pipit, the South Georgia pipit. But all of us expedition leaders, we would know of this islet offshore or, you know, this, these special places where the rats couldn't get to. And it had to be an islet or a little island. And we would go there and we would sell, <laughs> you know, we would brief the guests, you know, look for the pipit. For yeah. God's sake, you know, yeah. and and we would have, you know, who takes the first image of the South Georgia pipit and, uh, and and all that, you know, because it's you know it's it's a very, you know, you know it's no bright colors or you know, it, it, but but it's it's an endemic species, really beautiful. And, Can I? Uh, um, and it would be a 
nowadays, I think and we see the pivot ashore on the main island. So could I could I just just add to yeah, Jan and Aaron's comments on this that um, this is the largest rat eradication ever in, ever attempted anywhere on the planet. South Georgia is over 100 miles long. And as Aaron was describing, and yeah, and also that, that um, I think it also brings home, you know, the, the success of conservation, you know, that we live in a, in, a, in a planet where so much is all looking at degradation. And, and, and as, yeah, as, uh, as Aaron so eloquently said, that there was previous industrialization, and now we're seeing the whales return by their thousand. And when we're talking about penguins and seals, if you look across the island, we're talking millions. I mean, the fecundity, they're just the immense um, explosion of wildlife is what South Georgia mm -hmm. is all about. Yeah. And yeah. related to that is something that we all do when we go to any remote place, but especially to Antarctica, and even more so when we visit South Georgia, is the biosecurity that we do. And part of we were discussing a short while ago about getting ready and Jean was saying about your boots and things. Part of that rite of passage is learning how to go to these incredibly vulnerable places and the level of biosecurity that we go through. And we will we will ensure that all our guests are going through and obviously all our crew and anyone uh, shore going with our guides and so on is to make sure not even one little seed is jammed into one boot. Um, and of course, searching to make sure that we don't carry any uh, rodents in our rucksacks or so. We'd hope that's not the case. But, you know, that, that all of that is checked very diligently because it is a very, very hard thing to do to eradicate rats um, and keep them away. It also costs millions of dollars. Um, um, and so it is a real privilege. It's extraordinarily unusual to go to see these pristine areas. Um, that have become pristine through uh, through being essentially rewilded, if you will. Mm. Can I add two things after this discussion? The guest that asked if you have access to the experts on board, this discussion was indicative of what happened every day, all day. And the passion of these three men just came through. I just learned a whole nother lesson I didn't know and made me excited to learn about it. This is indicative of what happens on board. And secondly, these are two new ships down in Antarctica, but with vastly experienced officers, crew, scientists, expedition teams. As you hear the history these gentlemen have, they're not unique on board. And it's a vast experience in history that brings it all to life and to pers it gives us the perspective that I wouldn't have as an ordinary guest. I'm sorry, I just had to add it because I felt like I was back on board. My thoughts exactly, Jean. Fascinating <laughs> info. Thanks all. Uh, related question from Eunice in Whitby. She asks, we are interested in seeing as much wildlife as possible and noticed that this sailing has options to sail in October through January. Are there certain times that are more opportune to witness all of the wildlife present on this itinerary? <laughs> Um, can I pass? Can I pass? Uh, can I say one thing and pass it on? No, please, Jan, go ahead. Yeah, uh, perhaps some of the viewers. Uh, that was a great question uh, because you know South Georgia is uh, often coined the Serengeti of Southern Oceans, and uh, and there are enormous concentrations on relatively small islands. It's 100 kilometers, but. Uh, the concentrations of wildlife is on the coast and exactly where we're coming. Um, but uh, what I think is particularly fascinating, I always found it really fascinating, is you know compared to Antarctica, where a lot of viewers have may have been and, and learned a lot about about the breeding cycles of penguins. Uh, in Antarctica, you have a you have a breeding cycle that. Uh, you know this, the, the, the three main species, uh, the chinstrap, the gentoo, and the uh, Delhi penguins that we see on the Antarctic Peninsula, they, they have a relatively similar breeding cycle. Uh, it varies a little bit where on the Antarctic Peninsula you are, but you're going to see uh, birds early season preparing their nests. Uh, you're going to see the couples uh, 
hatching uh, uh, the egg and watching the egg and they're out uh, foraging and uh, replacing each other. You're going to see little chicks standing by the by the feet of their uh, parents and you're going to have these food chases uh, where the chicks try to have their parents regurgitate uh, a little seafood meal for them. Uh, and, and that happens throughout the season. So if you choose an early early uh, trip to the peninsula, you'll see, you, you might not see chicks. If you choose a late trip, you, you might see chicks uh, that are at different stages of growth. However, in South Georgia, uh, you have king penguins and they have a, a different breeding cycle. Uh, so no matter when you come to South Georgia, Early season, mid season, late season, you will always have chicks and uh, chicks in different stages of growth and also eggs on, on the nests. And this is where I'll chop the puck over to the, the marine biologists, I believe, because explaining that feeding cycle is, uh, requires some spe specialty. But I always found that really, really fascinating and a contrast to the, to the Antarctic Peninsula. I mean, I can build on just yeah, as you as you've quite rightly described that in South Georgia, where there is less intense seasonality. So the further south you go, there's a more intense summertime and a longer winter time with the ice. That um, South Georgia sits in a very interesting part where the waters of the South Atlantic and the just sort of around where the waters of the Southern Ocean are. So it's very very fertile waters which is what brings all the phytoplankton growing which in turn feeds the zooplankton um, and the krill which brings the whales which is why you can feed so many millions of birds and seals and so on and, and those are all feeding essentially on on a similar food source on the krill the, the, the small shrimps that make up so much of the biomass in the southern ocean and the, and the sort of that, that area that very um a highly reproductive area. And to the question, which has, as Jan said, is a very good question, is when to travel. Um, the days are slightly shorter in October, as opposed to being a little bit longer when we're down in the Antarctic Peninsula, especially uh, in the middle around Christmas time and January time. Um, and that brings its own joys. So you get the, the very, very long days when it's light the whole time, essentially in the middle of our of our time that we're down there, or in what we refer to operationally as the shoulder season, which is, if you like, the spring and the fall. And I'm sure if you're having a conversation about when's your garden nice at home, maybe with the exception of uh, maybe the middle of the winter, that springtime brings amazing things, summertime brings amazing things, fall brings its own beautiful things. It's the same uh, with the seasonality that uh, Jens just described. And with those breeding cycles in South Georgia being um, more spread out and that, that uh, youngsters are being born and raised at slightly sort of a broader time, there's no good and bad time. There are just simply different times uh, when there's always something extraordinary to see. Thank you very much. Uh, Frank in Colorado asks, do we need special attire or gear for this trip? Do you want me to say as a guest what, and a guest who's never done cold weather before, um, you do need to buy, bring layers, not a lot, but layers, long johns, light jacket, but Viking supplies a double parka, a red outer parka and a blue inner that I'm wearing every day now. And they supply those you keep and you take home, you see them in the picture, but they also supply the waterproof pants and the large boots that you need for zodiacs and landings and the waterproof suit and booties you need for kayaking. Um, I forgot a hat and I bought a hat and headband in the shop on board. So really the only thing additional I bought were layers and um, I was fine. Did I leave something out important, gentlemen? Gloves, and um, they do supply some gloves if you need them in the shop, but I brought gloves. The one thing that I wasn't prepared for was, and this is my ignorance, gentlemen, 
it's one the driest place on earth it is really dry so viking supplies you need to know sunscreen that is great to wear lip moisturizer that you need to use so those type of toiletries that you need are in your cabin and it is dry there it is really dry so if you need something for dry skin or whatever eye drops you need those and what did i forget gentlemen i would just say sunglasses very yeah. I went snow blind trying to film without sunglasses, thinking that looked cooler. And um, I did actually go snow blind for a, a few minutes. So you need good sunglasses yep. or goggles. And bring some warm socks. The, the boots are exceptional and, uh, and have some insulation capacity to them. But uh, everybody, I think every single person has a different ability to heat their feet and so some people need thicker socks so so bring the extra socks um, that uh, but yeah the gear we provide is uh, will will go a long way you have a, provide a packing closet. list oh sorry and you have a drying closet in your room that is fantastic so if mm -hmm. anything gets wet you put it in there and my wet socks would dry in about three or four hours which is just fantastic you will find that it's generally a little bit milder, uh, a little bit uh, more, you know, it's not as dry uh, as in Antarctica on South Georgia, the island of South Georgia. Uh, so it's, it's slightly warmer, but you will use the same clothes. You might take, peel off one layer compared to when you get down to the Antarctic Peninsula. But Mainly, you know, what you want to really want to protect yourself from uh, is the sun, the wind, uh, and your extremities, head, hands, feet. Uh, those are, you, you know, you, con you, you stop losing a lot of heat uh, at the extremities. And with windproof clothing on top of uh, different layers, you conserve uh, the body heat in your central torso and, and you know preserve that take care of it uh, release take off your hat release some down take it on again never lose it uh and uh, adjust uh hands and, and head uh but make sure you have windproof uh available uh all the time could I add one little is sort of clothing clothing it is you need clothing for your camera too or your phone so the best camera when you're there is the one you're using and many people use amazing phones now or, or bring a camera with them but uh, if by extension you're protecting yourself but also protecting whatever you're taking pictures with um, the uh, the opportunities the photo opportunities are unparalleled and uh so as well as keeping yourself warm and dry something that either if you are using a phone as, a, as your camera then one of those little protecting devices is a good idea uh the little sealed up uh, cases that can go around your neck um or if it's a bigger camera then whatever the water or indeed a waterproof camera is suitable um but uh a camera that is beautiful and high technology but stays inside your rucksack or inside the old coat won't get those amazing pictures. Fantastic advice. Thanks all. A question from Facebook, a viewer named Licia asked if the spa and thermal pool is included in cost of cruise fare. Is that, is that me again since I spent a little bit of time? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. The thermal pool is included and it is a wonderful spot to sit and actually full windows to watch everything going on. And there are spa services that cost, of course, but the thermal pool and the snow grotto and the sauna and the, am I going to mispronounce it? Bedestrom? I, I, Bedestrom. Bedestrom. Which is a hot tub, but that's the um, Norwegian name. Uh, those yeah. are all free to use and wonderful to use after a day out doing landings or on the Zodiacs. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, uh, Ryan from the US asked, is it typical to see emperor penguins on this itinerary or would it probably be just, and please excuse my pronunciation, 
Adeli penguins? Well, um, I can. So firstly, emperor penguins specifically would be rare uh, to see on any itinerary in the summertime, with the exception of the occasional ones that go to specific colonies that, uh, that we're not doing on this itinerary. Um, and that is in the sort of deep south in the Weddell Sea. So every now and again, occasionally, individual emperor penguins are seen on ice flows when they're molting. And that is an amazing opportunity. It has occurred um, every now and again. We've seen it on, on uh, Antarctic expeditions over the last year, every now and again. Um, king penguins look very like emperor penguins. They're just slightly smaller. Um, but, uh, but emperor penguins would be a very unusual spot. Uh, regard a daily penguins. So that's, um, they are actually the, the small brush tailed penguins that also deep south penguins. Uh, would tend to be seen further south, with the exception, actually, at the very top of the Antarctic Peninsula, which we are part of, the part of this itinerary of passing through, you do see a daily penguin. So there is a good chance of seeing a daily penguins um, on this itinerary. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, John has written in and asks, my wife is 90 years old and uses a walker, but otherwise is in good condition. Is this trip even remotely suitable for her? Aaron, I can, oh, yeah, sorry. yeah. Well, we, uh, we've had people with, that have had, I believe, a great experience. Uh, the ship is amazing and uh, we have accessibility like we should uh, on a modern ship. Uh, for both wheelchair users and walkers and, and so on. It's a super stable ship and, uh, and, and that goes a long way, uh, being stable. Uh, because if your footing is, uh, uh, if your yourself is a little bit unstable, a stable ship will help a lot. Uh, some of our activities are going into the Zodiac, into the submarine uh, and so on, they they require, yeah, even mentioning kayaks and so on, some of these activities require some uh, physical, um, so that you are, you know, some, some level of uh, physical fitness. And we will do, uh, we will help people uh, judge uh, for themselves if, if it's suitable or not uh, when you're on board and we'll try to describe it up front in, uh, in documentation. Uh, but, uh, but we've had people that are not super fit uh, uh, and with walkers having a great time on board the ship uh, without going ashore on these places without infrastructure because that's often the challenge. You know, it's a little bit uneven terrain uh, hard to set your foot uh, on a flat surface and so on. Uh, but we've also seen that people that we didn't believe and they didn't believe themselves that they were going to go off the ship actually went off the ship uh, because we have some uh, capability, for example, with special operations boats uh, that are not a ship. They're a boat, but they're a very stable, easy to uh, between the mothership and uh, the special operations boat. Uh, so we've been, we've been able to give fantastic off-ship off -ship experiences uh, to people with uh, walking disabilities and so on. But, you know, it's, a, it's an individual touch uh, that we will uh, help and guide. As long as you, as you are uh, relatively uh, healthy, because we're going to places without uh, access uh, to hospitals and so on. As long as you, as you are healthy, uh, and you you should be fine on board uh, the expedition, and and you, I, I'm convinced you will have a great experience. That's Wonderful a experience. Thanks very much. 
A question from Chris on Facebook. Uh, they ask, do Viking cruises to Antarctica actually cross the Antarctic Circle? Aaron, do you like Colin? Yeah, I can jump in with that. Uh, and that's that's a great question. On some of our voyages, we do cross the Antarctic Circle. The Antarctic Circle is the is a line of latitude that uh, is uh, located somewhere around 66 and a third degrees south latitude. And uh, on some of our trips, we go down there. Um, it's it's a uh, contrary to popular belief. You don't feel a bump when you cross it. Um, it's a it's a it's one of those geographic lines um, that uh, that some it's fun to cross. But uh, but really, we're we're targeting that. Uh, it's it's. It's one area that we can visit during a trip. We don't plan voyages specifically or sell voyages specifically as an Antarctic Circle crossing voyage. We'll go on a, a trip if there's, uh, we're, we're choosing where we go on the Antarctic Peninsula based on the weather, the ice, uh, the, the wildlife. Um, these are all sort of things that we're, we're looking at and the seasonality. And so uh, sometimes some parts of the season, we tend to have more luck with weather and wildlife uh, um, and ice uh, down by the Antarctic Circle. And sometimes it's just impossible or impassable down there. And so we're, we're farther up the, the peninsula. So it's really hit and miss whether we, we cross the, the circle. On the South Georgia trip, uh, it's unlikely we would, uh, would cross the Antarctic Circle because we'd be coming into the Antarctic Peninsula uh, from the Northeast and and uh, it's a long way down the peninsula to get to the the Antarctic Circle on the on the western side, on the eastern side of the peninsula, which is the side we're sort of approaching from. Uh, the Antarctic Circle would be down uh, deep in the Weddell Sea and uh, and impa impassable due to heavy ice. Uh, Shackleton tried that a long time ago and and had some challenges. Um, so we're not uh, keen to repeat that. Makes sense. Thanks very much. Uh, Chris in Durham asks, is there a chance to see the Southern Aurora Borealis in October or March on this or other Antarctic sailings? I would say, Damon, you should take this because you're probably the one of the three of us that's seen the Aurora Australis. Well, that's a yes. The, the, the short answer is it's much easier to see in the wintertime when the nights are much longer um, and you need a combination of of lack of cloud when it's also tends to be when it's colder as well. Um, it is in principle possible, although the latitudes that we're at in the summertime, it will be light for most of the time. So a little bit like spotting an emperor penguin, it would be a very unusual and a wonderful spot, as with all natural phenomena. Um, but uh, um, less chance than, say, going uh, up onto our northern lights with our ocean voyages in the winter time up into the into the high Arctic. OK, thank you very much. Just a few more questions. Thanks all for your great information. Uh, we have Bill from Windsor, Canada with a question. Uh, first, they'd like to thank you for the presentation and to Jean for yesterday's presentation. Uh, and asks, to date, have the submarines been deployed in the Antarctic waters and have these provided enriching experiences? Damon, I think you should answer this because the yeah. enriching experience is also a little bit owned by the science. Uh, well, that's a very good point. Um, thank you. Um, so short answer is, have the, our submarines been deployed in the Antarctic before? Absolutely. Um, we uh, our inaugural season at the beginning of 2022, when we started and there was uh, getting the, the, the whole, all of the systems up to speed and diving regularly. And we've just had um, a full Antarctic season for both Viking Polaris and Viking Arctantis, where we've had two submarines on each of the ships diving very regularly, um, up to 12 dives a day on each vessel. Um, and indeed, uh, hundreds and hundreds of dives have now been achieved. This has um, really been a, a real sort of a success in terms of getting things operationalized. In terms of the enriching side, um, thank you, Aaron, there's a nice segue here, um, that we have seen some extraordinary things underwater. It's so rare to be diving below scuba depth uh, in uh, the Southern Ocean in Antarctic waters. So that is below about 150 feet down to the 1,000 feet that um, our submarines can get down to. 
And in that window, every dive is potentially new for science. It's certainly seeing new areas that have never been seen before. Um, last season, we had the immense uh, fun and privilege to see regularly um, a very, very rare deep water species, a phantom giant jellyfish, um, which uh, we have uh, written up as a, as a small research note that was published and came out just a, a few months ago, um, which was very nice to be a first piece of published research, of, of hopefully of many from, from the operation, um, but also was indicative of what it is that you really can see extraordinary things every single time uh, our submarines go into the water. Um, you're genuinely exploring. This is this is incredibly rarely dived places, um, and we'll continue to be doing that naturally in in everywhere that we get the permits and we're allowed to continue with the diving. Um, it's uh, this this of course we're talking about the Antarctic here, but it's equally applicable when we're in the Great Lakes as well. That anywhere we're going, where there's been so few. Um, opportunities for humans to go down to a thousand feet to go and have a look around. Um, we're, we're seeing incredible things every time. Wonderful. Thank you. Just a couple more questions all. Uh, Chris from Durham asks, when does Viking expect to offer expedition cruises in the Arctic? I can, I can take that. Uh, that's a that's a that's a great question. And uh, this upcoming uh, season, we're going with both uh, the expedition ships into the Great Lakes. Uh, we had an amazing time in the Great Lakes. The communities, the places we went to, the experiences we had in there was uh, they were not inferior to any other expedition cruise I've ever been on. Uh, and uh, we're going in in there this year with both our expedition ships. That being said, um, we have the, the skill set in-house uh, across the expedition team members, the captains, navigators to operate in the Arctic. We have a ship that is polar class six uh, ice strength uh, and exceptionally capable uh, that can easily go into the Arctic. Uh, we have a uh, we have a number of uh, itineraries uh, in our, uh, in our, I guess, both scrapbook and Excel sheets and so on. Uh, and uh, and you know, we have uh, people in, uh, in leading positions in Viking that have a big heart for the Arctic as as well. Uh, pointing at two other guys in in the call here, uh, both Damon and Aaron have extensively operated in the Arctic, uh, myself from the Arctic. So uh, so we want to be 100% uh, prepared for, for doing such, uh, such a thing. Um, we want to make sure you as guests are willing to travel with us. <laughs> and uh, when we're ready, we will go to the Arctic for sure. Uh, I don't want to be any more specific than that, but uh, we have all the pieces to the impossible. Just haven't aligned them just yet. An excellent preview. Thank you so much, Jorn. And finally, we have a, uh, a message of gratitude from Shannon from Mountain View. Uh, she says, thank you so much for the presentation. And also, I love the sweaters that you are all wearing. Are we able to buy them on board? Yes, yes. The, uh, the, gift, the, the shop on board the ship has these sweaters in various colors, this color and the men's sweater is in gray as well, and uh, and the women's sweater in red, um, and blue, sort of a dark blue and a light blue as well. So a beautiful selection. And these uh, these sweaters. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong sleeve here. These sweaters do have a, a beautiful Viking logo on the sleeve as well. The design is 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 sort of customized for Viking, and and maybe Jorn, you can say something to the design. 
Yeah, I can say something to the design because you'll probably notice I don't have a sweat. <laughs> and I'm sitting in Oslo uh, where you can buy uh, a dollar sweater uh, on the corner knit shop. Uh, and uh, I could have done that. I'm at some relatives this, uh, for the Easter vacation and I left my Viking dollar sweater at home, unfortunately. Uh, However, I could have run down on the corner and bought a dollar sweater, but I couldn't buy a Viking dollar sweater because it wouldn't have the patch, it wouldn't have the same pattern, it wouldn't have Thor's hammer uh, as a zipper. Uh, and, uh, and they are very traditionally Norwegian. It has a really, really long history. Uh, perhaps the most famous uh, pattern is the Tina pattern. Uh, that uh, were used. Uh, every um, Norwegian Winter Olympics team gets a dollar sweater. So uh, often seen them when they are parading at ceremony. They wear a dollar sweater. Uh, and they make kind of new variations of, of this particular pattern that, uh, that you have here. And one of the more one of the famous patterns is based on the Odious uh, pattern, uh, which uh, was named after Odious Eriksson, the brother of the, a famous Norwegian downhill skier called Stein Eriksson, who emigrated to the United States and became a huge star for Warren Miller Entertainment, lived in the, in the United States till uh, just a few years ago when he passed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a it's a pattern and very proud of normal. Sure. Thank you so much for that history and for all of your informative answers to our guest questions today. Um, that is all for uh, me. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. I hope to see you in South Georgia. <laughs> we will. <Yes. laughs>